my name is Erica. And my name is Tara. And we are super excited to be here with you today, wherever you may be. Hit the subscribe button so you can get notified anytime we post a new video. Because you know what? Our videos are worth it. <laughs> and in case you didn't notice, Christmas is coming and we cannot wait to celebrate through RCC at Home for Christmas with you. We have a super fun service planned. It's going to be really special and it will be available for you on Christmas Eve morning as soon as you wake up. And looking ahead to January, we also have a lot of things going on around here. The first is January 3rd. We're hosting another blood drive right here at our downtown location. Here's the information for you in order to get registered. It's already almost half full, so go ahead and register for that as soon as you can. And also, our grand reopening service, you guys, January 10th. Mark your calendars. Go to rccsunday.com and you can get all of the information and what that looks like. And also, if you have any prayer requests or anything you want to talk to us about as a staff, fill out a red card and that's your way to communicate with us as well. Yes, we cannot wait to see you all again in January. But for now, we are going to head into a time of worship. So take a minute in the middle of this crazy Christmas season, take a breath, relax, and be ready to just connect with God and enjoy him through worship. And have a very Merry Christmas.
So hopefully you just got done worshiping God right now. You took some time out of your busy week, just a few minutes to, to meditate, to focus on him, to listen, or maybe even sing along. But you also have an opportunity right now to worship God with your finances. Whenever you give to him, you are worshiping him. And in 2 Corinthians 2.9, God says that he loves a cheerful giver. You need to know, too, that when you give it here at RCC, you're not only honoring God with your finances, but you're also helping to support the mission and ministries of this church. Now, there's a couple different ways you can give. You can drop off a check in person. We have a little mail slot at our front door. But the best way to do it would be to go to rccsunday.com, click on the giving icon, and you can set up a, a one-time gift, a reoccurring gift. You can use your bank account, your debit card. It's, it's super easy to do. So right now, we're going to continue on with RCC at home, and we have a little something fun for you. Check it out. Hey, RCC family, welcome to the week before Christmas. We're almost there. It's almost Christmas. It's four days away. And as I think about that, I think about what it must be like to be a kid at Christmas right now. The, the anticipation, the, the wonder, the, the magic of the trees and the lights and the cookies, right? Who doesn't want some Christmas cookies right now? I am excited about Christmas cookies. Uh, and hopefully, like as we get closer, hopefully there'll at least be a little bit of a dusting of snow so we can have some snow at Christmas time. And as I think about that, this, this anticipation that has to do with Christmas. Christmas is this time where we just anticipate this amazing thing, right? And as I think about that, like, like why do we anticipate Christmas so much? What is it about Christmas? I mean, of course, there's the, there's the presents, there's the family, there's the food, the cookies, but... But here's the thing that we sometimes miss about it. Not only have we celebrated and anticipated Christmas for thousands of years, but before the very first Christmas, people were anticipating it. They were getting ready for the very first Christmas. In Isaiah, which was written some six to 700 years before Jesus, it says this. It's in Isaiah 7, 14. It says, it says all right then. The Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. There's just something about Christmas, isn't there? It's, it's fascinating. And when we think about what it is about Christmas, it's, it's this, really, when we break it down. Christmas is the beginning of God breaking into our world, breaking into this broken, messed up world and, and having a plan to, to finally set everything right. And when it finally comes, man, it, it was as if the world, as if the parts of the world that are seen and the parts that are unseen couldn't even contain themselves. There's this, this small family, right? Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus, they're, they're in this barn of a stable thing. And, and in the fields just outside of town, there are these messengers from God, these angels who, who we might imagine also anticipated this day so fully that, that this moment was going to come. And so when it comes, they, they can't help but break into announcement. They, they get so excited about it. It's in, it's in Luke chapter, chapter 2, verses 8 through, through 14. It says, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, rightly so, right? They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. 
And you will recognize him by the sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And in that moment, you might imagine the wonder that those, that those shepherds felt. And so they race down into, the, down into the town to see this thing that has happened, this holy moment. And then when they see Jesus and this mother Mary and Joseph, they are in awe. And they can't help but, as they leave that barn or stable or whatever it was, they can't help but share it with every single person that they saw. Anticipation. It has this way, this way when it's realized of releasing this, this incredible joy. It just bursts out of us. It's this excitement. It's contagious. But here's the thing about the anticipation of Jesus. The anticipation of Jesus, it it had a purpose. The prophets, actually, they, they predicted the coming of Jesus. They foretold his arrival. But it wasn't just so people could just sit on their hands and, and wait. There was a purpose to it. It was, it was to inspire people in the meantime to get them ready. Have you ever heard the, the phrase, here comes the cavalry? The phrase where like, hey, they're coming, right? Like, it's, it's what you say when you know someone is coming to help you out. And, and when the cavalry is coming... When, when it's coming, you, you don't just like sit there and wait for it. You, you keep on fighting. You keep doing your job because you know that, that help is coming. Help is on the way. So you keep on doing whatever you have to do so that when the cavalry arrives, that everything's going to be okay. They'll, they'll help you finally win the battle. I mean, think about, think about how you anticipate Christmas. In the months leading up to Christmas, what, what changes about your life? A lot of stuff, doesn't it? In the anticipation of Christmas, your life is is filled with preparations. The the tree, the lights, the gifts and and the shopping, the the wrapping of those presents, which I'm awful at. I am such a bad rapper. You can tell when I've wrapped a present. And then there's the cookies, right? In the Christmas movies, our our lives look different leading up to and anticipating Christmas. We we have to prepare for it. We have to, to get ready for it. When, when Jesus' birth was predicted, it wasn't just for the purpose of telling people what was coming so they could, could then sit on their hands and wait. It was a call to, in that moment, be the people God called them to be in the meantime, to live prepared. It was a call to get ready, to actively wait. It's it's the metaphorical wrapping of presents, of decorating. It's the cherishing of the people you love. This anticipation, since the prediction of Jesus' arrival and with the first Christmas and with each and every Christmas since then, it's, it's purposeful. Maybe you grew up like me and you grew up with Advent. Lighting of the four candles each year, every Sunday leading up to Christmas, each one representing a different thing with hope and joy and and peace and love. These powerful things that are are produced in our world and and these things that that we can experience and feel in our lives and in our relationships because of a relationship with Jesus. And it's beautiful, right? We retell the story. We anticipate. We commit to valuing these these beautiful ideals of hope and joy and, and peace and love, but it's got to be more than that, doesn't it? I mean, it's got to be more than just those things. It can't just be so that we wait another little year and, and another little year to celebrate Christmas or basically a birthday party for Jesus. And it's got to be more than just doing that every year over and over again so we maybe feel good about ourselves. If, if Jesus is who he said he is, there has got to be more than it. There, there's got to be more, and frankly, there is. Christmas is this big, flashing sign stuck in the ground pointing forward. 
not backwards. Christmas is a reminder that Jesus, he came in and he changed history. It's, it's also a reminder that Jesus came and set all of human history in a new course, in a new direction. And, and you might be asking, like, what is that direction? You probably asked, where is all of this headed? Where is this going? What's the point of all this Jesus stuff? Is it, is it anything more than just living a nicer life, a little bit more of a life than the next person? It's got to be more than that. Let me be clear, it is. Jesus is not done yet. He's not done with us yet. Here's the, here's the picture that, that the Bible paints, the, the picture of what it's to look like, the final, like, this is a human history. It's going to accumulate to this and then go on into God's new way of things. It's, it's in Revelation. It's, it's Revelation 21, 1 through 4. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. That's a, a picture of what Jesus says is going to happen. That's the picture of of what Jesus will accomplish. It's a, it's a fancy term when we talk about these things. The fancy theological term is eschatology. It's a really fun word to say. Try it. Eschatology. How it all ends is basically what it is, right? That's what it means. And maybe better said is, is eschatology is the study of where all this is headed. Maybe you've heard the phrase, the end times. There's been a lot of stuff out there about this, and and plenty of it has really, honestly, distorted um, the view of what the Bible really says. And and it's a shame because it's actually made it harder to talk about. It's also stolen so much of the anticipation and the joy and the goodness of what Jesus says is coming. Because, Because this is the whole Bible story, everything about Jesus from his arrival to his teaching, to his healing, to his forgiving, to his death on the cross and the resurrection. They're the first fruits of of what will ultimately be Jesus coming back and establishing his kingdom, heaven and earth together, all as it should be, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Have you, uh, have you ever met someone and then been so excited to see them again. I mean, if you've, if you've ever had that like love at first sight sort of thing, or that like infatuation with someone, excitement about someone, you know what I'm talking about. You, you meet this person, you maybe have a great day together, and you just cannot wait for that person to re-enter your life again, maybe the next weekend or something. For me, it, it makes me think about when I, I got engaged. I, I, I dated my wife since I was like 10, right? Like not really, like 15. We were really young. But I dated my wife for a long time. And then in college, I'm like, hey, this is the girl. She's the one. I want to spend my life with her. I, I can't wait. I need to make this official. So before my junior year of college, I proposed to her. That's 12 and a half years ago. And I think to myself, whoo, I didn't realize what I was doing because that was going to mean a two-year engagement period two years before we got to get married I had to spend two years anticipating getting married and I was excited about it right like we we would talk and and be on the phone because we were in schools like four six hour drive apart and we would just talk about how much we were excited about what married life was going to be like together we would dream about it and honestly it changed how I lived it it gave me the hope and the joy and the peace and the love all those good feelings It it got me excited about what was to come But it also gave us two years of planning and prepping and getting ready for this for this new life together. The the waiting for Jesus is similar. It's this active waiting. It's this active anticipating. It's it's knowing Jesus 
and being so excited for that wedding day, that reunion day, that day when Jesus makes everything right, when he establishes his kingdom and things are how they should be. And in the meantime, it means us getting ready. It's this active readying of ourselves. It's, it's like how Peter puts it in, in 1 Peter. He, he says this. Um, he says this in, in chapter 4, verse 7. He says, The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or, or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. As we, as we actively wait and anticipate, what Peter is saying basically is, is that we're to be the church as we wait. We're supposed to live like this. This is, this is us preparing and getting ready. It, it means practicing hospitality, being kind to others, showing kindness like it's going out of style, right? Giving away, away this love that only Jesus can offer us that we can then extend to others. It means giving grace and forgiveness. And when it comes to the end, like how it's all going to get accomplished and all that sort of thing. When it comes to Jesus' return, when, when Jesus brings his kingdom about, when it comes to that, that's in God's hands. That's, that's not ours. He determines when that's going to happen. But it's in our hands as to, as to how ready we're going to be. I was flipping through this old, this old theology book, right? Like this old textbook of things. And uh, I know it sounds silly that I was flipping through a textbook, but I was. I was getting ready for this, this message, and I was reading a couple of different things, and, and there was this quote that I came across in here um, that I, I thought was really tremendous. Uh, I thought it was really helpful for how we understand this today. And it's by a guy named Edgar Young Mullins. I don't even know the guy, but I thought the quote was incredible. And so the quote says this. It says, We should ever watch against temptation, and pray for divine strength. We should cultivate a passion for righteousness, individual and social. We should work while it is day, knowing that the night cometh when no man can work. We should be so eager for the coming of our Lord that if he should come tomorrow, we would not be taken by surprise. We should so hold ourselves in restraint that if his return should be delayed a thousand or ten thousand years, we would not be disappointed and our hearts should be ever filled with joy with the prospect of his coming and the certain triumph of his kingdom. What if this Christmas, what if this Christmas amidst a world-changing pandemic, what if this Christmas we lived reminded of God's awesome power, if we lived knowing God's future plans? What if we lived with God's power in the here and the now, trusting it and believing it? If we lived and anticipated with joy and, and trust and hope that God will accomplish all the things that he, he set out to do? And, and as we anticipate, we can... We can live as the church that God calls us to live as, filled with, with hope and, and joy and peace and love. We can celebrate that Jesus came at Christmas. We can allow it to point us to the future that God promises us. We can practice and ready ourselves through acts of, of kindness and forgiveness and, and grace to live with the joy Jesus permits us to live with. I think... If anything gives us a picture of what the Christmas spirit is all about, that's it. That's what living for Christmas and anticipating Christmas is all about. And if you want that for yourself, this Christmas season, 
I invite you to pray with me. Would you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for Christmas and the anticipation that it brings every year. We ask that as we anticipate it, you would renew in us this understanding that we're not done anticipating and you're not done being at work in this world. You have a plan for it and a plan for us. Help us to live as the church, doing the things that you have us, that you would have us do. And as we do those things, help us to live with hope and joy and, and peace and love, knowing that you will indeed accomplish what you say you will. Trusting that we can trust you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.